Okay, so take me back to this Commodore 64 and then walk me through how video games were such a part of your life as a kid and then how you got into marketing. Yeah, so we have to go back to like 1987 is I think around the age that I got I, I was handed this Commodore 64. So thankfully, my dad was really into computers like he honestly loved them. Uh, and he came home one day with this computer and I had never seen anything like it. I didn't grow up with a whole lot. My, you know, our family was um, was not the most well off family. So when, him bringing home this computer was a really big deal. And so he brought it home, set it up, and uh, we had one of those big old uh, TVs on a wooden swivel base, you know, like the really old TVs. And so we hooked it up to that, and the blue sort of ready screen popped up. And I remember just looking at it thinking, this is, what is this? This is interesting. And so my dad fired up the first game, and I was hooked instantly. Like it what was, was just, the first game. Um, so it's, this is where it gets a little blurry for me because there was a lot of games and I was maybe six or seven. So, um, but the earliest game on the Commodore that I really got, you know, really into was called Zach McCracken and the alien Mindbenders. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I remember Commodore 64 was my first computer too, Really? And, but it was basic. The only thing I remember about it is using basic Q basic for yeah. some reason. I, yeah. So that too. And, and I loved, I mean, I just loved every aspect of it. And he brought home, like, I think he had like 200 floppy disks and I I would just like sit there and, and, you know, switch them out and try different games. Um, but having this computer in the house actually led to me playing with my sister um, with this. We used to play Office. We, we, we played a lot of games, but Office was one of the games we played. And I was always the CEO. Oh, that's always. awesome. Okay. And she's younger. So, yeah. of course, she was my secretary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you have a younger I'm sister. I'm the boss. You do <laughs> yeah. what I say. <laughs> exactly. So she was the secretary. And I and my dad had this, you know, cassette tape case um, that was red velvet lined. And I dumped all the paper, like the ca cassette tapes out of it, filled it with papers. And I'd walk around the house with this a briefcase playing on the Commodore. And I think it was then that I realized just how much I loved that whole sort of, you know, being attached to this computer, creating um, and having this possibility, even if it was just typing, you know, we had a dot matrix printer and I would print out things all the time. Um, I was just a, a really weird kid in that way. Like really. Um, but that love of computers uh, at that age, I think, was really what contributed to me sort of staying with computers. Um, and it really showed up in weird ways throughout my whole childhood and like high school and college. Let's, well, let's dive into some of this. <laughs> sure. So when I was really little, um, I used to I used to uh, take like I'd go around our neighborhood I'd, and I would peel birch bark off trees and rocks. I'd pick up like pick out these unique rocks uh, and I would go sell them to the neighbors because they had cottages nearby. And, and since I was so young and, you know, cute, I suppose the neighbors would buy them. And then when I was in high school, instead of getting a traditional job, I had this idea where I was really good at word processing, like really good. I mean, I don't know how you can be really good. Like, I'm not sure how that's a measurable skill, but I was just really good at it. I was fast typer. And so what I did is I had this idea to print out flyers and pass them around to all of our local businesses, offering my sort of temporary word processing skills. And um, that got thwarted, though, because my aunt and uncle owned an ice cream factory and they offered me a job scooping ice cream, which was way more fun. So I parked the idea. But that flyer was your first foray into marketing? Yeah, absolutely. I had to figure out how to market my word processing skills right. to all these companies and and make it appealing enough for them to pay me for it. So um, that never happened. But fast forward to college and I had this um, I had this job that I was just telling this story the other day on Clubhouse and they and the people on Clubhouse thought this was a funny story. So hopefully it's <laughs> just as funny here. But um, I had this job at the Iron Horse Saloon in Kingston and I was going to college and I got hired to sell roses. And I don't know if you've ever been in a bar where they sell roses. I didn't I didn't get out much in university. Okay. Well, I didn't either because I thought I worked there. So they would at the beginning of the night, they would hand me two dozen roses and they would say, hit the floor, sell the roses. I would sell them for three dollars. I would keep a dollar fifty. The bar would get a dollar fifty. Usually I'd sell them for five, um, you know, and I would keep the difference as well. But the best part was that I got really ingenious um, when I would when I would go and approach someone and say, hey, do you want to buy a rose? And if they said, I don't have anyone to buy it for, I'd say, buy me a rose. Right. So then. <laughs> then you could turn around and like sell it again. <laughs> so then what I would do is I'd sell all the bars roses and then I'd keep my stash in a different spot in the back. And then at the end of the night, I'd hit the floor again 
and resell all those like purchase roses for me awesome. at full profit. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just feel like I had all these moments where, you know, entrepreneurship, marketing, um, creativity, problem solving showed up really early. Uh, and then that flyer idea that I had was actually the basis of my first company, which is uh, so I started the, one of the first virtual assistance businesses in Canada. Um, so it was essentially well, the same idea. How, how did you get into that idea? Like coming um, out of college, what did you take in college? Oh gosh, that's that's the that's an interesting story. So I went to school in Kingston for advertising and public relations. Uh, I was doing great, loved it, except that I was really bored. I just wanted to work. Honestly, I was in school and I'm, I, I just saw three years of my life passing by and and I really wanted to just work. So I went for a year, um, had great grades, everything else, but then I left. Uh, after the year, I came back to Ottawa and my mom was working at a private college here in the city and, and she said, I can get you free tuition, come get, you know, get this piece of paper, at least you'll have it. So I did and I studied business administration. Okay. Um, and then the college ended up hiring me to teach in, in one of their programs. And it was there that I had a female CEO. Uh, she, she actually just um, handed over the reins of the college recently. Um, but she was so inspiring to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, seeing this this strong, confident woman leading a company, I knew I wanted to do that. So I Googled one day um, at work, I, I Googled online executive assistant. And I happened to see a few US-based virtual assistance businesses, but not very many in Canada. In fact, I couldn't find any. So I decided to start that business. And so I just did it. That's awesome. You mm -hmm. like jumped in, didn't really know much about it. And you were like, I can figure this out. Yeah. Where did yeah. that confidence yeah. come from? Uh, hmm. That's a great question. I don't know if it, I mean, I'm assuming it had to have been confidence a little bit. It was also a lot of fearlessness, I think. Um, I think what my parents were really great at was teaching me and showing me the way. So when I was, you know, as I was growing up, like I, I mentioned earlier, they, they, they didn't have a whole lot and therefore we didn't have a whole lot, but they were always trying to better themselves. They were always trying to, you know, take that next step in their own careers. Um, and so my, my mom and dad both got reeducated, uh, you know, later on in their lives, uh, which led them on a different career path. And, and they really succeeded and excelled in their, in their career. So I think just seeing them take these chances and not just get settled into a routine or a rut right. uh, was really useful. Yeah. So maybe, I, I mean, I'm guessing it's my parents. And then, yeah. okay. So like, talk to me about the marketing journey then, because for the next 20 years, you've basically worked in, in marketing in various ways. Yeah. Yeah. So when I first started the company, I, again, it was virtual assistant. So it was very broad. It actually wasn't specialized in marketing, but my very first and client- And what year is this? This is like- 2004. Okay. So yeah. this is like the internet's a thing and- mm -hmm. No social media yet. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't called digital marketing. It was called internet marketing, um, which is funny to see the transition from internet marketing to online marketing to digital. But uh, back then it was internet marketing. And my very first client was a, a founder in Silicon Valley. Um, he was selling an ebook- and pulling in five figures a month, selling this ebook, and he was a year younger than I was. And I remember just thinking like, this is actually pretty interesting. Like, yeah. what is this? And not only was he selling this ebook, but then he also started selling CDs where he would load up this uh, this information for women on beauty. And he had it on his on these CDs. His girlfriend was the person that did all the videos. And we would sell these CDs. And then we would sell them packaged with like this PDF. Yeah. And um, back then it worked really, really well. Um, that company went well. He ended up selling it. And then we started another one where he had an online... Um, like Texas Hold'em poker calculator okay. that would attach itself Before to- Before poker became huge. Yeah, it was like right at the cusp. It was okay. perfect timing. And so he created this uh, cal odds calculator that would attach to the online tables and um, and calculate your odds on every hand, basically. And so we, we started selling that and- then we partnered with all of the poker companies and we were at basically acting as an affiliate. That company got sold as well. And then he started another company that ended up selling to Ancestry.com for quite a lot of money. So this very first client for me was sort of the, I would say, the eye-opening experience I needed to sort of uh, specialize more on the marketing side because he showed me that, A, you can make money on the internet, which was brand new at the time. And I thought that was fascinating. And having come from not much, I was like, I want to make a whole lot of money on the internet too. So how do I do that? 
so that was really interesting. And then because of who I was working with in the referrals, uh, that just led to, you know to a lot more clients that were really specialized in that that area. And I just over time went from being a, a sort of general VA to more of a like actual you know internet well the time again internet marketer to now digital marketer what did internet marketing look like in 2004 i don't even remember paying attention to it yeah it was a lot of really rudimentary landing pages uh like say they called them sales pages back in the day so really long form sales pages um button like it, it's interesting when you think back like there wasn't even really the e-commerce structure that exists today i mean people were slapping paypal embedded buttons on these pages and and doing all of their e-commerce transactions through paypal or you know through affiliate models like e-junkie or whatnot but it was very much um it was the wild west in a lot of ways it wasn't like it is today. People were taking a lot more chances. There was a lot less regulation and rules. Um, so people, yeah, it was just like this new space and really quiet. And that's the difference, I think, between like when you look back at 2004 to today, back then it was actually really easy to cut through the noise, to, you know, make a big impression, to capture, you know, a segment of a market. That's very, like it's a lot more difficult today. So, so let's dive into some of those changes. What, mm -hmm. uh, what's different today? What's the same? Um, uh, and then how can we apply that knowledge? Yeah. So what's different? So I think the tactics, strategies, platforms, those are the things that always change. They're changing literally every single year. I mean, you know, even in the last year, TikTok was born, right? TikTok didn't exist. Um, so the, I think that those, the tactics, strategies, channels will always change. And that's just something that will constantly evolve. What doesn't change though, is the fact that we're selling and marketing is a form of selling. We're selling to people. And it's interesting because anytime I have the like, conversations around marketing, um, I always tell people like you can find a thousand people that will talk about, you know, metrics and CAC and LTV and conversion rates and, and open rates. And like those things are important. They allow you to like know if something is on the right track. But at the core of it, I think where we miss out a lot is that at the core of everything, it, it boils down to the people the people that you're selling to, the people you're marketing to, that hasn't changed and that will never change. Because in order for you know, you know, like you to have a market, you need to have people in that market. It's yeah. it's getting really complicated, right? The terminology is almost impenetrable. This yeah. even setting up something as simple as Facebook ads with tracking all the way through is mm -hmm. is more complicated than it seems to be. Um, yeah. How do we navigate this? Like, what do we what do we take away from this? What should people know about marketing that they don't know about marketing now, mm -hmm. about how it's done, ways to persuade? Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it always boils down to the foundation and the basics, it, because a lot of people, you know, as these as technology is changing and as these systems become more advanced and to your point, Facebook ads become even harder to set up. Um, that that's always going to be the way that it is. Things will always evolve. Uh, innovation will always evolve. But at the core of it, where we actually get a lot wrong um, with our marketing is in the foundation side. So I'll step into a company, a, a business. When I was consulting, I would I would look at their their website, their presence, their brand, all of it, and they wouldn't have the basics right. Yet they were trying to do these complex ad campaigns. And I would say to them, OK, you're going to spend $10,000, let's say, on this ad campaign. Where are they coming back to? You know, right. what, where where are you linking them to? What's the landing page? Yeah, right? the landing page. Like, what does that look like? And for a lot of people, they, they would say, well, I'm just going to send them to my homepage. And, and it's like, well, do you have anything to convert them when they land there? You know, are you capturing them as a lead? Are you trying to convert them into a paying customer? Like, what does that look like? And then does the story align? You know, if you're popping up an ad on Facebook, does that does the message you're, you're sending there align with the message that they receive when they get to the destination? And so I think a lot of people, um, even though the tools are becoming more complex, they're forgetting the basics. Right. So I always when I get anywhere, I start there. Because we can always hire out the pieces that are like, you know, the more complex ad, you know, ad techniques or SEO or, or whatever it might be that's a little bit more, let's say, specialized or complex. But you as a company and you as a, an entrepreneur, a startup, uh, an individual, someone with a personal brand, you have to get those basics right. And it's usually the place that people just don't put any time. 
So if I give you like a limited budget and I was like, how do we, what, what are the things that we should focus on? What mm -hmm. would you suggest? Yeah. So I would start with uh, looking at your website. So, you know, I always think about the foundations of marketing similar to building a house. And so when you think about building a house, you obviously pour a foundation. Um, that foundation is sort of the place that people are going to land. So if I go out in the world and I do 10 different marketing initiatives or, you know, leverage different channels, I'm obviously sending everyone back to somewhere to do something. So what is the somewhere and is the somewhere ready to do the something? And I know that sounds a little bit abstract, but we'll get into that in a sec. So if... If I, if I was going to start anywhere, I would literally be looking at the website to make sure that, you know, do we have those conversion opportunities in place? Is the story aligned? Um, you know, is there, an, is there some sort of emotional appeal to people? Did you spend enough time talking to human beings, real human beings, to figure out what the core message should be? Like, what, you know, is your messaging on point? Is your positioning there? Uh, are you thinking about things like branding and community? Um, the stuff that, you know, is is a little less sexy because it's often not attached to something specific ROI wise, um, but really required. Uh, so I would start with, you know, sort of a full website audit, get all that in place. Um, and that would involve as well messaging because if you're, if your messaging is at all not aligned with, with the people that you're trying to talk to, they're going to land there and feel like you're talking a different language. Um, so definitely, you know, website messaging, positioning, making sure that you really deeply understand your cut, your, your customer. And I'll give you an example. So FreshBooks, um, which is an accounting company in Canadian, they, uh, when they were, when they first started the company, they went out and, um, started to acquire customers. And in order to make sure that they deeply understood the customer's actual problems in order to speak the language that was required, um, you know, to, to really get those people to do something and convert, they interviewed, uh, and I'm not just talking like a, a quick survey or questionnaire. They deeply interviewed the first 100 customers that they had. That, that came through the door. And what that allowed them to do was align their messaging to the specific pain points and problems that those right. people were having. But so many people don't do that. So many people don't even have a single conversation. With well, the it's costly, it. right? Yeah. Like it's expensive. It's time consuming. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of labor and effort and digesting. And yeah. Yeah. So that's, but that's where you have to start. You have to start with the, with Cause, the people. Cause you're really just marketing. Like you're solving a problem. Mm -hmm. You're what, tell me more about the story aspect. Is it yeah. like your company's story or is it sort of the, the customer's story that yeah. you're playing into? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I like to look at it. It's, I like to look at it as something that's very multifaceted. So when I look at, um, a brand, let's say I come into a brand new company and I'm sort of looking at it with fresh eyes. What I want to know is a few things. I want to know what the story of the company is. Like, how did it get started? You know, why did it get started? What's the, what's the value, um, system that exists around the company? And answering that question about the why is probably the most important thing. And most people can't answer it. So whenever you ask an entrepreneur, you know, why did you start this company? If their why is something like, well, I just wanted to make money, right. you know, or I, I just really wanted to be a startup founder. Those things aren't necessarily a deep enough why to get people to feel emotionally attached to what you're doing or to feel emotionally connected. So I always ask, like I like to go deeper. Like, what was the moment you realized that this problem that you're trying to solve was important? You know, what did that look like? And, um, you know, and at Fellow, as an example, like Aiden's got a great story. Like they were run, they were building another company. They realized that they didn't have tools as a manager to really do their job well. Um, and he recognized that problem. So what was great about that is now he can take the problem he felt, the very specific pain point, and he can turn it into a company that's solving problems that are actually um, touching on a real, a real true pain point. Um, so I always like to start, start with the why, um, you know, so the one part of it is definitely maybe the founder's journey, maybe it's the company's journey, but then it's also definitely the why of your, of your customers. You know, what problem are you solving for them? Um, and, and I don't just mean, because I think what happens often is people get their customers on the phone they're doing customer interviews and they're asking the, the the same questions that every company asks. So it'll be like, what problem does, you know, our, our software solve for you? And the, the person that's answering will say something like, well, it helps me manage my meetings better. And, 
But if you start, if you really start to dig deeper than that, you know, like, but you know, why, why did you need this? Like what, you know, what is it allowing you to do that not having this tool, um, you know, wouldn't uh, allow you to do. And so when you start to really dig under the surface, you realize that some of the problems that your customers are dealing with are much deeper. They're not just the surface level things that you're hearing. Um, and I think that's where the magic is. Cause then you start to realize that some people land in a management position, for example, and they, you know, they're, they're not entirely sure what to do. They feel a little out of their depth. Um, and if you can figure out how to help them solve that problem, they're going to feel a lot less imposter syndrome right. or a lot less nervousness or fear and everything else comes after that. Let's double click on some of the questions that you can ask people mm -hmm. to sort of get more about their pain, their experience with your product, how you mm -hmm. can, um, I guess, get the best information from them. Yeah. Well, I, you know what I'll say, um, Shane, is that you actually do a really good job at this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean that sincerely. So, you know, I actually think podcast, um, you know, podcast hosts, anyone who's interviewing other people, anyone who's having conversations, I would say if anyone's struggling to figure out how to get questions and information um, out of people or answers and information, just listen to some podcasts that are really well done for a while, because you'll realize that, you know, it's not about just asking questions on a list. It's not about saying, okay, here's the top four questions. I'm just going to stick to that. What it really is, is, is asking the first question, but then listening to what they say. And, and maybe the second question on your list doesn't make any sense anymore because of something that they, something that they've said is taking you on a different journey. And so I think having curiosity around, you know, those conversations and, and letting them be a bit more open um, helps a lot. So when I'm having conversations with customers, yes, I always start with, you know, what problem is this solving for you? Sure, we can start there. But if they say something like, you know, well, I, I can't seem to get my team engaged, you know, and then I'm hoping that this tool helps. So my next question might be like, well, what happens when you can't get your team engaged, mm. you know? And then it might be, and how does that make you feel? Right. You know, and and if the person then is like, well, it makes me feel like I'm not a great manager or a great leader, then it's like, OK, and what does that do? You know, what does that stop you from doing? What are you trying to achieve as a, a manager or a leader? And as soon as you start digging into like the actual human behavior and the human characteristics, but more so just actually caring about them as a human being, um, I think that's where you can ditch your script you know, all of these questions that you see on the internet where they're like top customer interview questions, right. ditch them and just have a real conversation. And then what do we do with that? So like I tell you, I mm -hmm. feel insecure about being a manager. I can't get my team. I'm worried about my job. Mm -hmm. And then how does that translate into the story, the brand, the yeah. marketing copy that we read on the page? Yeah. So that's, uh, so that's, that's a great question and a big question in a way. So essentially, and I can only talk about my own process. Obviously everyone's going to do this probably a little differently. So what I like to do is I actually keep a running, um, you know, whether it's a Google doc for me, it's a, it I do it in fellow in a shared stream. Um, and so I keep a running list of all of the little things that I've heard people say that aren't the very surface level things we hear all the time or things that people are putting on social media. Um, I like to keep a running list of all of the things that people are actually saying, right. the things they're really feeling. And then what I like to do is we do a lot of messaging exercises in the marketing department. So that'll look like, um, you know, maybe we pick a page on the website. Maybe we're picking a blog post. Maybe we're writing. Maybe we are writing some social copy. Um, but we always go back to those really intimate conversations. And I like to think about the person that I had the conversation with. So if I'm going to write an email, if I'm writing a blog post, um, I'm thinking about that person. And so is the rest of the team. Right. And I think it has to become almost your library, like your go to, you know, reference um, library as a marketer, because the minute you lose sight of that, the minute you lose sight of those unique pain points and the feelings, you're just writing copy to write. Right. Uh, but it, all that to say, all of those messages, the the feelings, the emotions, they get translated into everything. 
from, you know, images on the website to copy to social posts to videos. Um, they inform, honestly, we do a weekly video. They inform the video subject. Uh, I, I get emails from people all the time where they're actually opening up about real management and leadership issues that they're dealing with. And I take those and I turn them into videos where I'm speaking from myself to them very humanly. And then as soon as it's done, I send it back to them. And I'm right. like, hey, now we've helped other people as well but we've answered your question. So I think it can show up everywhere and it should. It should stretch into everything you do. And then I think furthermore, you need to also communicate it to the rest of the company and the teams as well. They need to understand, I think, you know, that yes, we're building a software or whatever it is that you're building. Um, you know, yes, we're doing that, but we're actually doing it for real people. Right. Because I think in the world of marketing, business, startup, all of it, we get so fixated on numbers and growth and traction and hockey sticks and everything else that we forget that the only reason we have businesses is because of other human beings. We, we lose track of, like, I mean, you get lost in the metrics, right? Yeah. And you can also have situations where the metrics look good, but the, the company's sort of like on the cusp of failing. Yeah. How, how does the information that you gather then go back into the product? Like what's the relationship between the marketing team and sort of the product team? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a great point. So I think every company is going to have different challenges with that. With this, I'm very fortunate that at Fellow, we have a really good relationship with our product team. And so what we're doing often is we're having huddles where we literally sit down and, and you know, we're taking the synthesized data that we've accumulated from all of these conversations and we're passing that along along to product. It doesn't necessarily mean that product is going to be able to act on every single thing. You know, they have to obviously prioritize and, and act as that piece of the company in terms of choosing, you know, which new features will come out. Um, but I think the closer you can tie those two things together, as long as you're having those regular, you know, bi-weekly, monthly conversations, uh, those, those decisions that get made in product are a lot more aligned. And I'll give you a perfect example. So right now at Fellow, we're obviously developing a whole lot of features and we've listened to our customers. We've listened to what they're going through over the past six, seven months working remote. Working remote has a lot of challenges. And so we're looking at our next you know, feature release to be very aligned with solving those specific problems. And that only happened from having, you know, conversations regularly with the customer, listening to those and then synthesizing them into real features that will help. And then how do you determine what, when you're solving a problem, it's a problem that's existed in the past. Like, how do you mm -hmm. know that problem is going to exist in the future? Yeah, that's a, that's another really great point. So sometimes you have to make big bets. Um, sometimes you also have to look for patterns and trends. So if I'm talking to customers and one customer says, you know, well, I, I don't know, like, you know, I'm really struggling with X thing. Um, and who knows what X thing is? Maybe it's just like I'm struggling with getting um, enough meeting analytics to know if my team's, you know, actually doing meetings well. Um, that could be one person's pain point. But unless right. we sort of see that show up, you know, a few times and it feels like it's more than just maybe one person's uh, issue. It's sort of like at that point, you have to sort of look for the look, look for the trend lines, look for the recurring themes. And when you're paying enough attention, those things are pretty obvious. And then how do you make sure you have a representative sample? Because I would imagine that there's like a vocal minority of mm -hmm. people who speak up about an issue, but it might yes. be, you know, one out of a thousand. But since you have hundreds of thousands of customers or something, it seems more frequent than it actually is. Yeah. So that's where pro you have to be proactive. You, you, you know, because absolutely the loudest people will always be the loudest people, 100%. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's representative of the whole. So we have a few ways we do it at Fellow. Um, you know, we we collect, you know, NPS, like Net Promoter Score. Um, what is that? Everybody talks about that. Yeah, I have no so idea what that it's is. It's essentially like the happiness level of your customers and how sad they would be if your, if your product didn't exist is essentially what it boils down to. Like, I know I'm making that very basic, but that's where it's at. Um, so essentially they score the product um, and they they say, uh, they answer the question of like, how sad would you be? Uh, I don't I don't want to look at that because like I am the product in some ways. So if <laughs> yeah. People, yeah. people weren't sad if I didn't exist, I think that would be a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a little, it's a little harder for a personal brand. Yeah. For sure. It's a little hard to confront that truth. Um, but you could still do it. You could still do no, it. No, let's not. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so yeah, so we look at things like, you know, net promoter score, we look at survey responses. Um, and then in order to make sure that we have a really diverse sample set of, of those uh, conversations, we, we actually just make a, a, make it a point to pick people to have conversations with. Right. And sometimes that means cold choosing from, you know, the list of a, just randomly calling people and yeah, being like, Hey, you've been a customer them. for. Yeah. Or we can look at things like their usage. We also, we pick people based on usage. So we'll, we'll choose some people that have high usage on the product. We choose people who maybe only have logged in a few times because even their perspective on why they've only logged in a few times is really valuable as well. Um, I like to I like to talk to people across industries, across job titles. Um, you know, for us, it's managers, it's direct reports. They have very different viewpoints about the product because most managers are the ones bringing it into an organization and direct reports have to use it. Um, so you can imagine some of those conversations are a little bit like, well, I'm using it because my manager wants me to. Right. But once we dig in, it really starts to let me know as well, even from the direct report side, like what can we do in product to even get them more engaged? And that's not the majority. The majority of uh, even direct reports are very happy to use the product. Um, but for those that aren't, it's sort of like, how do you, how do you. Well, nobody likes being told to use anything no, these it's days, true. right? So yeah. like you're naturally, you have your backup. Yes. And then- yeah. So yeah. So it's a lot of things, uh, and I think, but you do have to be really intentional. To your point about, you know, how do you make sure it's diverse? How do you make sure it's a great, uh, you know, sort of slice of of your customer base? You have to be intentional. And then everybody talks about like A B testing, mm-hmm. titles, and copy. Yeah. Does that actually make? How much of a difference does that make? What things do you A B test? And like, yeah, everything. 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 Okay. So I, I don't even understand that. Like, how can you A/B <laughs> test everything? Yeah. So we test. We A/B test everything from small image changes to headlines to subheadlines to descriptions to little pieces of copy to really big pieces of copy. We A/B test a lot of things in product. Um, what you're looking for in an A/B test is uh, obviously you want to know what's going to perform the best. I mean, that's why you do an A/B test. So when we say perform the best, that usually means what, which piece of thing, wh- which image, which piece of copy right. converts the most. It's actually mind blowing sometimes. Sometimes you run an experiment and honestly, there's like not enough difference to, to you know, where it's like, okay, we could go with either option. It didn't really matter. But we actually recently ran an A-B test that ended up having a 3% difference on conversion, which... Okay doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a lot That's when you huge, think, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it was a 3% conversion lift and, and it was on the, just adding one word, one word. What was the word? One-on-ones. One-on-ones. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. And so like you learned the, the, and did you learn that from a conversation with somebody yeah. and that translated into the yeah. copy? Yes. Yeah, oh, exactly. So we, again, we, you know, Aiden's have, like our CEO, Aiden is having conversations all the time. We're having conversations, customer successes, like our entire team sales. Uh, we, we all, even the dev team will shadow a lot of our customer success team just to hear the language, which I think is really valuable. And it was through those conversations that we heard quite a bit that people were starting, they would start using fellow for one-on-ones and then eventually expand that out to all their meetings. So when we recognized that, we were like, okay, we don't have one-on-ones in our subhead. Let's add it and see what happens. And yeah, 4% different in conversion. What else have you learned about sort of like A-B testing copy in terms of headlines and like where do people get stuck or what common mistakes do people make that they can avoid? Yeah, that's a so edit, 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 edit. What I mean by that is when you write your headlines or you write your subheads, start with like the first version and then edit it three more times to take out words because your headline, I guarantee you, has too many words. Um, unless, of course, you've wrote like got milk, in, the, in which case you can't really take it anymore. Maybe you could just go to milk and it would be a statement. But um, but most people write too long, like they write too verbose. I talk very verbosely, so I'm you know working on on editing even my own speech patterns. But um, just when you when it comes to your writing, really edit it down. And then I like to use pain. I like to use emotional words. It doesn't always have to be a pain point, but like I always like to think about like what is the emotion that I'm trying to evoke in this thing. What are examples of emotional words? Like what? Yeah. What so comes to mind. So, for example, I'm going to try to think of something that we've recently done to make it really relevant. So, for okay, so most people don't like meetings, right? 
we know this to be true. Most people actually hate attending meetings. I like meetings, which I'm a little bit of a weirdo that way, but it's fine. Most people don't. And so if I was to write a, a, a headline for a fellow, I could call it, you know, a meeting agenda app. And you don't understand what it probably is, like whatever. But if I was to write like, um, you know, some, and I, I can't do this on the spot. I feel too much pressure. But, you know, if I was to write something like, um, you know, meetings suck, you know, or, or a better way right. to, you know, have your meetings or even that and was I a little bit I see myself soft. in it, right? Like yeah. I, I see myself going, you yeah, I to. think meetings suck too. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. And then yes. that gets me to read more. And I think people hold back. They don't want to get too emotional. They don't want to, they don't want to dig in or, or be too controversial. So they stay really, you know, um, benign. The best thing you, actually people could do is if you go and read like podcast titles or blog post titles, um, I'm not advocating for Buzzfeed style headlines at all. Cause I think those are awful. But, um, if you go and read headlines, read enough of them and see what you viscerally react to. Right. And that's how you know that the words that were in that headline um, evoked an emotion. Oh, that's so and then try to do the same thing. Like it's a lot of trial and error. Um, and it's really hard to get people to write emotionally if they're, especially if they're very logical. And like, how do you look at the internet? Are you always looking for like headlines that grab you? And yes. do you have like, what do you do with them? Do you store them somewhere? Do you like? So I used to keep a swipe file, but then I found that I wasn't actually going back to it very often. So what we did instead is we started a, a channel in our Slack, um, Slack workspace. Um, so I started a, a channel there and it's just called marketing ideas. And so what we do, and it's now company wide, it's not just the marketing team that does it, but company wide, anytime anyone sees anything in the wild, that is a great headline or a great ad, or maybe it's a, an, um, an image that they thought was great or a video, they post it into this marketing ideas channel and, and it's become like this living, breathing swipe file. So I think anyone can start a swipe file. You could use any tool to sort of, you know, capture the little bits and pieces around the internet that you like. But yeah, I can't look at the internet anymore without seeing it. Because you're always evaluating. Like when you see a Facebook ad, are you like, oh, I wonder what the performance is in the back 100%. end? I would have done it differently. Mm -hmm. And you're always, oh, that's going to change how you surf. The yeah. Internet. It that's also crazy. makes me a little bit cynical and jaded. <laughs> oh, wait, double click on that. Yeah. Well, so for example, um, you know, if I Google something now, uh, two things happen. One, if it's anyone in the competitor space, I absolutely click on their ad. Right. <laughs> because it costs This is money. a thing. Yeah, yeah. People don't do this. I actually don't do that very often, but um, that's mostly to be funny. Um, but the other thing is, because I, you know, because I look at everything through the lens of marketing, I, I can't look at anything that anyone says without knowing that they're doing it for a reason. Right. You know, they're writing copy for a reason. They're they, they, but, but at the same time, good marketing isn't felt in my, in my mind, like good marketing, you shouldn't actually feel it. Cause there's times when I'm actually on Instagram, I'll be scrolling Instagram and I see something and I click it and I buy it. And the next thing I know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just got bamboozled. Right. right. Like I just got, I just, but I didn't notice it even as a marketer. Yeah, that's really interesting. I also find like searching for some, wait, for, before we get into that, the mm -hmm. ad thing, it's a real thing. Yes. I know people who run businesses and they're like competitors click all the time on these yeah. keywords and it drives everybody bonkers. There is a way in uh, most ad uh, things, though, if you get your competitor's IP address, if they've uh, signed up for your product yeah. or signed up for a newsletter, you can grab their IP address. You can block them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, I recommend it. But when you search for something, it follows you around the Internet. What's yes. going on there? Like I search <laughs> for something on Google and then all of a sudden it's on Facebook. It's on like. Mm -hmm. Amazon, it, it seems like it just like so my it, device is listening to me. It's, and I was going to say it's actually worse than just what you search for. It, it's it's a thing. And in fact, it's such a thing that I don't know it's how creepy. much. Are you on TikTok? No. Oh, well, so there's a viral like trend. Chinese on face recognition <laughs> technology. That is probably accurate. Yes. Um, but there is this trend on TikTok where people usually it's, um, you know, people that want to get engaged or want to have a baby. And what they do is they grab their partner's phone and they say into the phone, engagement ring, engagement ring, diamonds. And they oh, just gosh. say things over and, and over. And it starts to show up. So oh. that it shows up on their partner's phone, which I think is actually like the, it's a funny way to describe the phenomenon. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there are like all the thing is, is, you know, there's, there are all of these, um, you know, pixels that follow us around the web, these cookies, whatever it is, tracking, we'll just call it tracking in general. They follow you everywhere. They're listening. And it's great as a marketer, 
cr- a little creepy for me. Like even as a marketer, I actually don't love um, that side of marketing. If I'm being really honest, I don't really love that. But uh, but it is a thing. And, and you can't escape it unless, I mean, there's like ways you can. It's very right. complex, though, and most people won't do Do you remember that. when Gmail first started that used to show you like ads based on sort of the yes. content of your email? Mm-hmm. We used to have so much fun with that because we would just put things in white text at the bottom of emails and we could prompt the ads that people get displayed because <laughs> they'd be looking really at the smart. email. Oh, well, caused a whole bunch of trouble, but yeah. I wonder if you could do that and actually have your own ad show up. In Gmail. Oh, that'd be interesting. That would right? be clever. I don't know if it does ads anymore. I didn't even pay attention. No, there, there are Do still that? ads. Oh, yes. Yeah. In the, only in the promotions tab, though. Oh, I think I pay for it. That's why we oh. don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That well, you've, you've escaped. Sense. Well, you've escaped. You pay, well, <laughs> this is it, it, right? Like you're the product mm-hmm. unless you're paying yes. because so, somebody has to make money off of you to pay for all this yeah. technology on the back end. I'm this close to deleting my Facebook. Oh, tell me about that. Why? Um. So... That's a thing. People are talking about that. Yeah. Now. You know, what's interesting is I, I actually don't know that I would be on social media at all if I didn't. Well, you're in marketing. Like, I how know. How can you even say that? I know. But I don't think I would be. Why? It's uh, so uh, I have a complex history with social media in the sense where. You can't just say that. <laughs> Not dive into it. If I, so I got on all the platforms in beta, all of them. Twitter. Okay. Like, you know, LinkedIn, YouTube. I have a couple of YouTube channels that I was doing daily vlogs on when daily vlogs were cool. Um, I grew that too. It's, it's you know, it's not a lot. I have 10,000 subscribers. So like, that's not a lot. But like, I, I played. more than most people. I played a lot in yeah. those spaces. And, and it, what was interesting was I did it really young. So I was 21. You know, I was starting to get in 21. Obviously, some of the platforms weren't out yet. But as they were coming out, I was getting on these platforms and I was sharing a lot. Like I, I'm an oversharer on the Internet, or at uh, least I was. I see where the story is going. And I've also gone through a lot in my life. Like I've I've gone through, you know, severe entrepreneurial burnout and depression. I've blogged about that. That was actually I'm glad I've, I blogged about that. That was a, one of those overshares that actually worked out to be quite great because it connected me with a lot of other people struggling with that. But I also um, I did things like I shared a lot of my life, like my whole pregnancy, my, you know, my divorce, which you know, if you go through a divorce, um, you think at the time that it's like great to share that with a whole bunch of people that you don't know until you share that with a whole bunch of people you don't know. And I, and I, and I was doing silly things. Like I look back and I think like, you know, I just, I didn't know at the time. No one knew it was brand new. This was a new frontier, but I did things like I, I would jump on trends. So it just so happened when I was getting divorced, Gwyneth Paltrow and, and her husband were also getting divorced and they coined that term consciously uncoupling. So I wrote a Medium article about how I was also consciously uncoupling. That didn't work out so great. I ended up in some red pill Reddit groups and like oh, wow. it, it, the Internet is a dark place. Yeah. So so I had this like forever. It, it Honestly, it does. Yeah. And that stuff is still around. So at the time, I didn't mind. I didn't mind sharing my whole life. I didn't mind being more open about it. But as I got, got older and my value systems were changing and my relationship to social changed and my relationships changed and I needed less from the outside world and needed more like I was getting more internal in my actual personal relationships. Uh, I just was I didn't want to do any of that anymore. And so I find now I'm on all of these social platforms. I still like sharing, but I'm right now trying to figure out how to do it in a way that feels appropriate for now. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, With also the future in mind, right? Because Mm -hmm. everything I think that's one thing we're going to look at in the future and we're going to be like, what were we thinking? Yes. Right. Like, why does everything live forever? Why doesn't it self delete after a certain period of time? And why or, do we feel like we have to put everything on the Internet? Yeah. What? And this is like the thing for me where I getting back to the cynical and jaded piece. Like, you know, I think it's like what's missing in your own life. Right. And and I think as as the Internet became so much more expansive, it connected us to so many more people, but actually disconnected us so much from ourselves and the people that are actually in our lives. Uh, and, and I just think to myself, like, I don't want to have to need people that are outside of, you know, that are on these social platforms. I, I don't want to have to need that. You know, like that just doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Can you expand on like how it removed us from the people? Like how you're, when you're saying that, 
the people close to us, what do you, what's going on in your head? Like, how are you talking about that? Yeah. So I, I, I think it's, I mean, we, this is going to be a, a, a tangent rabbit hole, but I think as human beings, we can't get everything we need from any one person. And, you know, and so I think what, what ends up happening is like, you know, pre social media, you, you had to sort of explore and expand your network with other real humans to sort of get different things, you know, to, for example, connect with like minded individuals or get join like a mentor group or maybe it's a fitness group that you want to join, whatever it might be. You had to actually go and be intentional about that. And then the Internet happened so, and social media happened. And all of a sudden we could con connect and I right. use air quotes for that, connect with all of these people in these different spaces spaces without actually ever having to find them and seek them out. And the internet um, puts this sort of, you know, layer in between human beings where there's a sense of connection, but because you're looking at it through a screen, you're not having to actually look at the person in right. the eyes, right. in the real eyes and see, you know, what, what impact that, that it's having on them. So I think there's a piece of that. And then I also think, you know, we're humans, we have egos. And I think social media was like this perfect firestorm for anyone who had an ego, you know, where they could go and instantly get, you know, the ego boost they needed from social pretty quick. And so for me, it's uh, it's been this like unraveling of social media for me to figure out, like, does this does this actually suit my needs as a, as a human being? And and am I am I trying to take things from it that is, is unhealthy, you know, that are unhealthy versus am I leveraging it in, in a much more healthy way? Am I trying to have still have communication and connection and conversation, but do it in a way where I don't crave it and I don't right. need it, you know? I think, yeah, we're going to end up in this place like five years from now or 10 years from now where we look back and uh, maybe we're using these tools in the wrong way or it's just going to be this endless rabbit hole where mm -hmm. people start opting out on mass. Yeah, well, and honestly, you know, it, it's it's moving faster right now with remote work as well. Um, and I know that this has nothing to do with social or marketing, but I worked remote for 15 years. I I, I saw all of the ups, the downs, the the positive sides, the negative sides. Uh, went back and took a job. Now I'm back working remote. Obviously, the you know the way the world is, and what's happening with a lot of people right now, and I don't even know that it's conscious yet, I think it's very subconscious still, is that when we work remote, and it's the same thing when you look at social media and same thing when you look at marketing. So it's actually all related. So when you have this screen in between you and human beings and you have this thing and it and it feels like they're far away, their numbers, it's their metrics, their their, you know, followers on a on a social platform. There's there's a removal of the human element of right. to that. And then what ends up happening is things become transactional, right? even at work right now. Like uh, I'm not, I don't mean at fellow, but I yeah, mean in yeah. general for people at work right now, everything is transactional. So it's no more like, hey, you know, Bob, how was your weekend? How are the kids? Right. It's a ping on Slack to say, where are we at with this? Right. Transactional. Oh, that's interesting. And we're almost, we're almost creating these relationships now that are built on ones and zeros versus the actual like emotion part of it. And that's the same thing that happens in marketing. And when it is awful and it breaks is when people think of it as a transaction versus the actual human connection part of it. I just want to explore that a little bit more because it strikes me that we have all this goodwill built up with people we've already worked with. And so this transactional thing probably doesn't have a huge cost at the start, but over time it will erode that bank of the repository of sort of goodness that you have together, you know, as Toby um, would call it the trust battery. Uh, but with people you don't know, and now you're developing a relationship with somebody who's a new hire, you're getting into this transactional relationship at the very start. How does that, how do you think that plays out? You know, so I did, I, I did that for 15 years. Um, and it's, it's hard on the psyche, like really hard because your, your value and your worth as a human being starts to be directly attached to output and pr productivity right. and contribution it's my and title who I am mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and it's a that's a slippery slope so I got on that hamster wheel in my 20s and it was it was chaotic and I mean don't get me wrong high highs but low lows as well and it was very transactional and I never felt like I could get to a place where I was 
you know, satisfied because the, there was always someone asking me for something. Right. And, and that eventually led to, you know, for, to me for, or for me feeling burnt out. Um, and that's going to happen with companies right now. If managers and leaders aren't careful and if they treat a lot of their new hires, existing hires in a very transactional nature um, and they treat their, their market and their customers in a very transactional nature, those things eventually fade out because people just get burnt out on that. They get burnt out. They, they disengage. They, they start to look for somewhere else where they actually feel like they have meaning and belonging. Right. Cause those things, when you're transactional, meaning and belonging don't exist. I think that's a great place to end this conversation. This has been fascinating. Yeah. It's Thank been really so good. I know we've gone all over the, no, this, all this over the great. place. Well, you talked about organic and sort of like listening and going yeah. where the conversation goes. So really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.